Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another opportunity to come before you. We thank you, God, for blessing us to study your word. We ask you, Father God, to bless us and keep us. Bless your word to follow this soul. Bless us to be about your business. It's in the strong, mighty power of the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who died for us and rose again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good to see everybody out for our first night in the new year of Bible study. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me say to our audience, thank you for praying with us and praying for us. We always begin the first uh, month of every year in prayer. So this is our first Bible study, the first week in February. Amen? Amen. We'll be looking at Philippians during this series. We'll look at the book of Philippians. And as we look at Philippians tonight, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. Verses 1 through 8 is where we will be tonight. Philippians is written by who? Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Why we call him the Apostle Paul? Philippians, the book of Philippians in the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul. Why, we, why do we call him the Apostle Paul? Why do we refer to him as the Apostle Paul? Is there a reason, or are we just saying what other folks say? Because he is an apostle. Because he is an apostle. So, is there any other apostle still living? If Paul is dead, and Peter is dead, and John is dead, are there any living apostles today? Apostles such and such. Are there anything that you know sure about this? Are there any living apostles today? Sister Irvin, are there any living apostles today? Some claim that they are. Amen. So we believe that the apostle has to be one that has actually walked with Jesus or and or seen Jesus, right? Paul is called the apostle Paul because he actually experienced Jesus on the Damascus Road. And he even declares, I am an apostle out of due season. I'm an apostle after the season of being apostle was over. But he experienced Jesus on the Damascus Road. God spoke to him on the da Damascus Road, so therefore he's considered an apostle. Amen? And uh, I never will forget that one day a, gen a gentleman walked up and he said, I am apostle such and such. And Pastor Reginald Rose said, you sure are looking good for your age. Amen? Uh, I don't think the apostle got that, but uh, I got it right away. Amen. When we look at the book of Philippians, we will find the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi while he's about 800 miles away, theologians believe, that he was 800 miles away. And where he was, he was not on vacation. The Apostle Paul writes this book of Philippians, and he's not on vacation. Where, where can you imagine that he is? He's not at a resort, he's not on vacation, he's not writing from a hotel, he's not in a library. Where do you think the Apostle Paul was? He was in a Roman jail in prison, right? And he knew he was about to get out of here. Isn't that something? Paul knew that sooner or later he would die because of his convictions of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there are some people who say they have convictions of Christ, but the moment things get rough, they deny him. You remember Peter, don't you? Peter had some issues. What was one of Peter's issues? He talked too much. He talked too much. Every church has a Peter. He talked too much. Don't look at me. And it's usually the one that says, don't look at me. <laughs> Every church has a Peter. What were some of the other issues that Peter had? Peter talked too much. Many times when he talked, he was talking at the right time and he's being spiritual, so it's okay. But other times he spoke, he spoke out of turn and Jesus had to correct him. What's another problem that Peter had? He was a cusser. Peter was a cusser. We found out that Peter was a cusser. 
Every church has a cuss ministry. <laughs> they have those group of people that can cuss in a heartbeat, and if you make them mad, they'll cuss even the preacher. Amen? Another problem that Peter had, he sometimes, when he spoke out of turn, he called himself spiritual, but Jesus had to let him know that he wasn't being spiritual. One example was, Jesus, you will not wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, I have no part of you. So then he says, not only wash my feet, Lord, start at my head and go down to my feet. Watch all, wash all of me. What's another problem that Peter had? Peter had a, a temper problem. Had a temper problem. Every church has a member. They got a bad temper. They probably ain't going to bother nobody, but when you bother them, the world knows it. Have a temple problem. Well, another problem that Peter had, he had a violence problem. How we know he had a temple problem that caused a violent problem? Cut off Malchus' ear. Cut his ear off. He had a line problem. And I'm getting close to that. He has a line problem. I want to deal with that. He has a line problem. And when we talk about uh, some of the things that Peter did, we can identify with some of the things that people do that we know. He had a line problem. How do we know he had a line problem? He wasn't one of Jesus' disciples. Okay, the girl said, you, you one of Jesus' disciples. He said, no, I'm not. And then somebody said, well, I saw, him with, saw you with him. No, he didn't. You know him. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> He's just like some, some people in the 21st century. People just, just lie. But the big one was that night that he denied the Christ. He denied knowing him. He denied the Christ. So Peter had issues. But the same Peter preached in 3,000 souls got saved. What it says to us is that we need to understand that even though we messed up, God can use us. So we got here by talking, we got to talk about Peter simply because uh, we were talking about the fact that Paul was in a jail and people deny him even when they're not locked up. So theologians believe that he was 800 miles away, locked in a prison cell when he penned these words. And he says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. He writes this letter, and Timothy is his associate, right? Timothy is considered his, his son in the ministry. He writes this letter to to the people in Philippi, and he says that Timothy is writing along with me, he identifies themselves. He identifies the two of them as bond servants. He identifies them as servants. Many times, Paul will not identify him as the apostle Paul. He identifies himself as a bond servant, as a servant that is keyed in to Jesus Christ. He is here to serve Jesus Christ. He is a servant unto the Lord. Are you a servant to the Lord? Are you just winging it? Are you giving your all for the Lord? Are you rather do other things than serve him? There's a principle called servant leadership. In servant leadership, the servant is the leader, but the leader serves better than anybody else under his or her guidance. That's why we have servant leaders at our church. We don't have directors. We don't have presidents. We don't have vice presidents. We don't have coordinators. We have servant leaders. Because we believe that servant leadership is what we ought to be about. So, if we have a servant leadership mentality, 
then we ought to make sure that the leader is serving the greatest. So if I'm the pastor of the church, there ought not be anybody who can outserve me. I ought to be a servant leader. That doesn't mean that I ought to do everything every time, but you do understand that I ought not ask you to do anything that I won't do. That is beyond me or beneath me. I'm off the floor. I pick up paper. I take the trash out. I appreciate those who do that where I don't have to do it, but it's not beneath me or beyond me. So a servant leader. So Paul says that I'm a bond servant. I am a servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't identify himself as an apostle. He doesn't identify himself as a preacher. He identifies himself as a servant. Not only a servant, but a bond servant. Somebody that has been arrested. Somebody that's bound. But you need to understand that he is bound because he wants to. He is bound because he wants to be bound. He's yoked with Jesus Christ because he wants to be yoked with him. Somebody in this room can identify that when you were yoked with somebody, that you don't want to be yoked with, that's a miserable life. Don't say amen, say off to something. It is. It is. It's a miserable life. It is. To actually be yoked with somebody, to be engaged with somebody, to be yoked with somebody, you got to go home with them, you got to work with them, you got to play with them, and you yoke together with them, and they just make your life miserable. I oftentimes tell people, you don't like your job, don't complain about it, get you another. That's right. You may find out that the grass really is not greener on the other side. When young, young Bush was the president, people complained we got a B student as a president. People complained that he couldn't think fast enough. But now people would take Bush. <laughs> Two, three, five of them. <laughs> really is what we have now. Amen. Show oh, you're right. <laughs> the grass is not always greener on the other side. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Lord. Any witnesses in the house? I mean, they just gave Bush a hard time. He went overseas. They threw a shoe at him. <laughs> now, when they throw shoes at you overseas, that's the ultimate disrespect. That's hatred in his all time. Best. And we wonder now why shoes are not being thrown and other stuff is not being thrown. Are you with me? So because he was yoked with Jesus Christ, he's going to serve him, as the singers back home said, to the balance of his days. I'm going to serve the Lord the balance of my days. I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Then he says... To the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. So he identifies where he, he's writing. He identifies the people. So he's talking to the saints, right? He's not talking to people who have not met Jesus Christ. He's talking to the saints. He's talking to saints, not ain'ts. He's talking to the saints. So if he's talking to the saints, He's saying some things to a certain particular group of people who ought to be living like the Lord. And ought to be living like they know the Lord. The question is, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus handle it? So he's saying to us tonight, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Your thinking your acting, your conversation ought to be like Jesus. Isn't that something? It ought to be like Jesus. So he says, now first of all, let me start with, with the bishops, the pastors, the leaders, and to the deacons. You may want to write this down for the test. 
there are only two official officers in the local church. Y'all talking about minister of music, leader of the ushers. There are only two official officers in the church. The pastor and the deacons. The only two. And guess what? In our church, we only got two. The pastor and the deacon. Are you with me? So there are only two official officers. Everybody else are brothers. Everybody else are sisters. The lady told me, since you're not going to call me pastor, or not going to call me preacher, or not going to call me reverend, don't be calling me sister. I don't like that. I don't want you patronizing me. So now when I call, I just start talking. Hello, how you doing? Very nice. Another lady told me, one day you're going to call me pastor. I'm not. I'll call you by your name. Yes. Can I ask you a question? So we went to a church that had a pastor, man and woman, wife, husband and wife. Mm -hmm. So you only addressed the man as pastor and didn't switch you dress his wife as. Okay, the question is, I go to the church, I'm going to preach or I'm just going to deal with it? We've been to a church that had, you preached at a church that uh -huh. had a pastor and wife. And you saw what I did? I didn't, that's why I can't remember. You just remember. Wife. Wife. Okay, the question is, you go to a church. This is not Philippians, but the question is on the floor. The question is, what do I do personally? What I do when I go to a church that have co-pastors, male and female pastors, I address the male as the pastor. That's my. That's my. That's that's me. That's that, that, that's not something that you may need to do. That's not something that you ought to do. That's just what I do, and that's what I did. And I thank him for inviting us. I thank him for being part of our worship and a part of our service when he came to us. And if she had come, I would welcome her and thank her also. But my convictions would not allow me to address two people as the pastor. My conviction would not allow me to address her as the pastor. It's my conviction. My conviction may be wrong, but as long as it's my conviction, I'm going to stick with it. Because I understand something real good. Anything with no head is dead. Anything with more than one head is a monster. It's a freaking nature. It's a freaking the spirit. Woo! I'm going to get some phone calls and emails after this presentation. <laughs> Sister Whitlock just set me up. Sorry. <laughs> As I drive, I can I can address all of them. <laughs> he says, I'm, I'm writing this to the to the, the church at Philippi. I'm writing this to the bishops. I'm writing this to the deacons. In other words, he's writing it to the church. All who are not bishops who are the pastors, all who are not the deacons, who are the servant leaders, all of those are, all that are not are part of the church. So he's writing to the church. Are you with me? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you. Blessings, blessings to you. You ought to greet people with a smile. You ought to greet them with the blessings of the Lord. You ought to greet people with enthusiasm. Grace to you. God's love to you. God bless you. God keep you. Grace. Grace to you. Are you with me? So you ought to, you ought to always, you ought to always just treat people right. Is that all right? And if you don't know how to treat people, ask somebody. <laughs> you ought to treat people right. Just, just ought, to, ought to be right toward people, you know? Treat people as you would want them to treat you. If they think that you're doing them wrong, guess what? If it was you, you would think you, they're doing you wrong. 
Just treat people right. Grace to you, peace to you. Many times you will hear the phrase, go in peace. Go in shalom. Go in peace. From God our Father, the Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is his greetings, right? He's greeting this church. He's saying, good morning. I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Love to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Blessings to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, our Father, and Jesus the Christ. You with me? So grace to you, blessings to you, in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. I thank God upon every time I think about you. Every time I remember you, I thank God. For you. There ought to be some people who have made a difference in the preacher's life where the preacher can come back and say, I thank God for you. Is there a preacher, a pastor, that you have been a part of their ministry that can say, I thank God for you? Can your pastor today say, I thank God for you? Or did the last church you were where you were, did the pastor, whew, glad she gone. Glad he's out of here. You think your pastor said that about you? Raise your hand if your pastor said he's glad. You. <laughs> if your pastor said, oh, Lord, look at the greatest victory ever taken place. <laughs> Anybody? Just one? I won't call your name. <laughs> I can say that uh, uh, oh, my Lord. old pastor. Don't go, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Have my, mercy. My Pastor Fletcher. Yes. Pastor Fletcher said, I'm so glad that you're here. Yes, he did. It's a great thing when your pastor can say, girl, I'm just so glad you're here. He, he was just part of our family. We had so many tragedies. And he said, I'm glad that you know the Lord like you do. And I'm glad you know. But, you know, we, are, we used to tell the children, uh, us when we were young. Yes. You know, I love you. Pastor Fletcher was a great man. Had a chance to preach there a few times. So we have to understand that we can set the stage of a being, being appreciated, or we can set the stage of our exit. Which stage are you sitting? Anybody? <laughs> which stage are you sitting? Which, which platform are you on? Is your pastor... Glad you're here. Is your pastor just going through the motion and putting up with you? Yeah. Is your pastor loving you because you are a lovable person or is he loving you because you are a child of God? Or is he loving you because you're a human being? Just that's a rhetorical. Those are rhetorical questions. But it ought, it ought to generate something in you. Is, is your pastor glad you're here? Has your pastor told you he's glad you're here? I think yes. All right, I got one. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Every time I think about you, I get excited with such an excitement that I look back and I say, Lord, thank you. One reason why Paul is thanking the Lord for this Philippian church is because they gave to him when he was there in ministry. They supported him. They uh, supported the gospel of Jesus Christ that he brought to them. Even when Paul was looked upon as a criminal who, who fought against the church, 
there were some who still believed in him. Now the question today is, when your pastor fails, when the preacher does not measure up, do you still support the gospel of Jesus Christ that he has given you? Even when your pastor makes you mad, do you still support the gospel of Jesus Christ as if nothing is wrong? So the question is, can your preacher thank God for you every time he, remember, he remembers you? He says, I thank God for you always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Philippians chapter 1 is where we are. Verse 4 says, I'm always thanking God for you. And not only am I always thanking God for you, I'm petitioning God on your behalf. Lord bless them. Lord, give them the desires of their heart. God, keep them safe. Lord, arrest their foolishness. I'm always praying for you. Paul says, always in every one of my prayer, every prayer of mine, I am making requests for you, all of you, with joy. I'm making requests for you all. Now, you do know that the church of Philippi didn't have all good members, right? We, we, can, we can kind of reason that. <laughs> that there were some of them like you and like me and, and like the folk that's sitting next to you. But he says that I'm thanking God for you all. It says to us that we, can, we can't just pick and choose who we pray for. Because if you pray for the, for the person that is not, that is not doing the right thing, then your prayers may be what that person needs to do the right thing. Paul says, I'm praying for you all. Every time I pray, first of all, I thank God for you. Now, theologians believe that Paul was 10 years removed from this church. On his second missionary journey, he went through and, and spent time with this church. But this is said to be 10 years later, and he still is thanking God for it. Will your pastor thank God for you 10 years later? Did your last pastor thank God for you 10 years later? I did your last pastor. Ooh, thank God. That headache is gone. And uh, some other pastor got that problem. The analogy is given uh, by a pastor. He says, uh, well, you're not going to go get them. They left. He said, you see that bottle on that table, that bottle of Tylenol? <laughs> he says, he said, the reason why you take Tylenol is to get rid of the headache. <laughs> you don't stop taking so the headache can come back. <laughs> so in, in other words, you need to position yourself where the man of God can love you, thank God for you, and pray for you. He says, I'm always thinking about you. I'm always praying for you. I'm always making requests for you all. I'm making requests for you. And I'm doing it with great joy. The Bible teaches that the preacher ought to be able to lead and have joy in his leadership. Are you allowing your preacher to lead with great joy? Or does he say, Lord, have mercy? Now, you know, there's a difference in saying, Lord, have mercy. And Lord have mercy. There's a difference. I'm sure you can figure out which one it is. Which one is your preacher saying about you? <laughs> Lord, Lord have mercy. And then he tells the reason. In number, verse number five, Philippians chapter one, he says, number one, I remember you. Number two, 
I pray for you. Number three, I'm making, making requests for you, and I'm doing it for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now. Fellowship. You know, that's why we have birthday parties. You do, you do know that, right? We have birthday parties so we can fellowship. We have events so we can fellowship. The word is kononia, means to get together, to have, um, to have great fellowship. It is to mix and to mingle. Kononia, to have fellowship. So all of those people who are introverts, can get a chance to be with some extroverts in fellowship. Yes, ma'am. I have a question, Pastor. Uh, if uh, somebody, you know, not really about you, and they say, I'm going to pray for you. Say, say it again now. I'm going to pray for you. If somebody is really, I missed something. If someone that you know that's not really serious about God are you, oh, okay. and they Mm -hmm. uh, my response to them was thank you but uh, maybe you can render that prayer to someone <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> listen you putting me all down this road <laughs> you putting me down the road by my hair hang on, hang on. <laughs> okay the question the question is if somebody is not for God and they are not for you but they come to you and they say, I'm going to pray for you. And they said it with the attitude, of, oh, Lord, I'm going to pray for you. And you said, is it okay for my response? Uh, say that prayer for somebody else. <laughs> I didn't say, say it for someone else. I said, thank you, but. Thank you, but. I, I rendered that prayer to someone else. Rendered that prayer to somebody else. <laughs> well, I wouldn't advise it that way. <laughs> Because remember, we are, the, the first few verses of this same chapter says, grace and peace. The word peace is shalom. The word peace means to, to always approach a situation with a peaceful attitude. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Am I pastoring yet? Yes. yes. All right. So you ought to always be the person to put the fire out. Believers ought to be firefighters. It ought not just be just be the pastor who's putting the fire out. Every believer ought to be conditioned to put the fire out. What am I talking about? You ought to be conditioned. You ought to have in your heart. You ought to have in your mind to put the fire out. What am I talking about? You ought to have an attitude. Say it again. You ought to have an attitude. You, I didn't get the first part. You, you ought to have an attitude to put the fire out. What am I talking about? What am I saying? Somebody help me. You ought to put the fire out, right? Uh, the grievance, the uh, disagreement. Okay, if you got a disagreement. You let, the, you let the people see the God in you. Let the people see the God in you. So it's with love. Be the peacemaker. Be the peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemaker. So, servant, you say something? Be a mediator. Be a mediator. Now, now, you're one of the persons that's got to be mediated, right? So if you become the mediator, you put the fire because you're the one that's causing peace, right? So the idea is to always be the one that approaches a situation with grace and peace. Whenever there's a fire going on, God wants to call on you to put the fire. In the country, when we had... Uh, a, a pot belly stove. Y'all with me? Uh oh, y'all under 40, you don't get it yet. It's a wood burning stove where, where you would put wood in it. One of the ways they, they got to the point where they put the fire out was they pulled the log off the fire. Or they refused to put another log on the fire. If you take, if you, if you take the supply away, 
then the fire would die out. Take the log off the fire. Don't you be fighting. Don't you be the one that they, they, uh, they said, well, there's two fools fighting right there. I don't know which one is the, it started and which one's in it. But when you stand back and you look at the situation and you step out of the situation, then they say, that fool's still fighting. Are you with me? So you want to be the one to put the fire. You want to be the one to back down. You want to be the one to speak a soft-spoken word. People stay married because somebody decided that we ain't going to fight tonight. We ain't going to argue today. Now, it may be the same person every time, but thank you for being a peacemaker. Somebody got to put the fire. In silence, it's not always the way to put the fire. Because sometimes your silence speaks louder than your words. I'll tell you what, I ain't talking to you today. You just started a fight. You have to make sure you have the right God-like attitude in order to put the fire. Paul says, I'm thankful for you, and I, I pray for you, and I have great joy as I pray for you. I'm making requests for you. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day up until now. He's saying that you, you had the great fellowship of the Holy Gospel. You want to make sure that you operate like you know the gospel. You don't get mad at everything, do you? How many people get mad at just any little situation? Any little thing pop out, pops up. We got to have fellowship. One with the other. He says, from the first day I met you all, you all had fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You all supported the gospel. Verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. What very thing? He tells us that he who have begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Look at what he's saying here. Because you are a Christian, Christ has begun a good work in you. This church at Philippi supported Paul in his ministry. God had begun a great work in them. Those of you who are out here tonight, the temperature is below 50. Some folk, the temperature will get below 70, they ain't coming out here. Some folk, the temperature can be 98, they ain't coming out. Because when it's 98, it's too hot. When it's 60, it's too cold. When it's dark, it's too dark. And some people don't even support the gospel in the daylight. Woo! Being confident of this very thing. He who has begun. Who is he? He who has begun. The God who has begun. Jesus who has begun. A great work in you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. The old folk would say, I'm going to serve him the balance of my days. I'm going to serve him the rest of my life. He has begun a great work in me. He's, whether you see it or not, whether you agree with it or not, he has begun a good work in me. I'm not talking about a good work that people see. I'm talking about what God has started on the inside of you. God has started a great work in you. He has started a great work in you, and he is willing to continue it until the day that he shows up again. The question is, are you willing to continue working through the good work that God has started in you? Can God use you and depend on you to continue the good work? Can he depend on you? Can God depend on you to allow him to continue the good work in you? The great work that God has started in you, he will continue it if you allow him to. 
You fall off the horse, get back up and ride him again. You make a mistake, you get back up. Everybody in here make mistakes. We have labeled one mistake bigger than another mistake. But let me tell you, if God doesn't keep us, we can't keep ourselves. God has begun a good work in you. He wants to continue it. Will you continue it? And will you allow him to continue? Because things that God has called us to, we can't do it on our own. We got to let it continue in us, that work that, that God has started. And, and what it's saying to us also is that God is the one who starts the good work. What we do, we might think is good work, but only God starts the good work. And God is able to bless us to continue that work. He says to the church at Philippi, God has started a great work in you. God has used you for great things. Even if it's not anything but to be a blessing to the preacher. Look at Paul. Paul said, I remember you. I remember how you treated me. I remember how you obeyed the gospel. I remember how you dealt with God. He started a good work in you. Let him continue the good work until Jesus returns. Begun a good work in you and will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you also, of you all, because I have in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in my defense and in confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me in grace. He gives them credit. He gives them credit for what they have done. And he says it is confirmation of the work that God's called us all to do. He says, just as it is right for me to think this of you all. And he keeps saying you all. Why do you keep saying you all? Why do you keep saying you all? Is he saying y'all? Or are you saying all of y'all? Are you with me? Because some preachers can say, I thank God for y'all. And then they can say, I thank God for all of y'all. That's two different things. I want to be able to say, thank God for all y'all. And I believe I can say that. Thank God for all of y'all. Thank God for everybody. Because I have, because I have you in my heart. You made an impression on my life. Now I got you in my heart. There are some churches I just love to go preach to. There are some churches I go to out of obligation. What's the difference? And why? Why would I go to church? I have an obligation, and why would I go to a different church? Because I just love to go there. Yeah. Same reason you do stuff you, you don't want to do. <laughs> Everybody look at the preacher. He, he know he didn't want to be here. Well, you didn't want to be here either. Don't be hating on me. I had to drag you over here. What's the difference? What's the difference? It's just like I think of you all because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my chains. What is he talking about in my chains? Paul says, I got you in my heart even in my chains. Somebody help me here. While he's in prison. While he's locked up. While he's in chains. The only time we really put put guys in chains is when they're some bad actors. Or they are a threat. 
Usually in, in the U U.S. of A, we put people in handcuffs, click, click, and that's it. But when you see a joker with a chain wrapped around his waist, a chain, two, three chains on his arm, and a chain on his legs, and then a chain on his ankle, and he can only step two inches at a time, that's a bad actor there. Or they think he's a bad actor. He's a flight risk. He's a violent person. Paul says, I was put in chain. Because of the gospel, I was put in chain. Because of living for Jesus Christ, I was put in chain. That right there would have been enough to discourage us a long time ago. No question. So, this Christianity thing, I, I can't do this. I ain't going to be able to do it, bro. I ain't going to be able to do it. Somebody telling me why I can't go? I'm going to be locked up. I can't. Forget this. He says, I've had you in my heart even while I was in chain and in defense. The word apologetics. Good test question here. The word apologetics. Apologetics is not the word that means to apologize. The word apologetics means that we are here to defend the gospel. It's a ready defense. Peter says it like this, always be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. And you ought to be ready to defend it. No Muslim should be able to turn you around. No, no, what's the latest one out there among black people? No, no black Israelites should be able to turn you around. Y'all hadn't heard black Israelites. Huh? Boy, I gotta, I gotta teach, I gotta teach some apologetics in here. We have one right down the street, right here. When we went down there to give the baskets away for Christmas, we took the basket to this young man's house, and he began to question the boys about, y'all know Jesus is black. Why are you going to church on Sunday? You ought to be going to church on Saturday. They're very confrontational. You mean, man, you ain't telling them that Jesus was black? Very confrontational. And they're violent, too. And they're violent. And so he says, he said, well, you can take that basket back. If you ain't telling these boys the truth, you can take that back. I said, man, go get that basket. <laughs> He went and got the basket, but he didn't give the bag back. So he went and got the basket, came back. He's still trying to talk to the boys. I said, let's roll. Let's go. So when we got in the car, they started asking me about what he was talking about. We have to be ready to stand firmly against the wiles of the devil because there's some new stuff out here that some of y'all hadn't seen or heard of. Okay, go do your study on black Israelites and bring a report next week. One page, double space, size 12 font, inch on each side, bottom and top. He says, in my defense, in confirmation of the gospel, while I'm defending the gospel, while I'm giving out the confirmation of the gospel, you supported me and not only did you support me, you stood with me, and I just thank God for you. Amen. You are partakers with me in grace. In other words, the grace that God has given through Jesus Christ, you're my brothers and my sisters. Somebody came to Jesus as he was speaking to the crowd. Someone came to Jesus and said, your mama and your brothers out there want you. Jesus says, my brothers and my sisters are in this room. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? Why did he say, my brothers and my sisters are in this room? Why did he say that? Because we're all uh, children of God, and we're all brothers and sisters. In Who are? Those in Christ Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So because we're in Christ, we have Christ in us. We are all brothers and sisters through Christ Jesus. 
Are you with me? And Jesus also says, and I call him the Christ of chaos. He says, if you love your mom and your daddy more than you love me, basically, I'm paraphrasing, then you're not mine. I have come to turn mothers against daughters, daughters against mothers, sons against fathers, fathers against sons. I have turned them, I've come to turn them against each other. He's not trying to cause chaos in the family. He's making a statement that I'm in, I ought to be more important to you as your savior than your family is. In other words, when your family disagrees with this gospel, when your family disagrees with the, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, when your family disagrees with the love and the grace of Jesus Christ, you ought to stand with Christ. When your friends turn your back on you, you better stand with Jesus. The other day overseas, a preacher got beheaded because he wouldn't deny Jesus Christ as his Savior. You know what beheaded is? What happens if you get beheaded? You bleed to death. On the spot. Question of the day is, are you so convicted, so confirmed in your spirit, have confirmation in your heart, that you're going to stand with the gospel regardless of what other folks say. That's the question. Regardless of what they're going to do to you. Oh, we have freedom here. We go to any church we want to go to. If we do the right thing in November, we'll continue to go to any church we want to go to. Let me just pause right here and say this. The devil has always been slick and sly. And, and the devil will even fight for prayer to be reinstituted. The devil will even talk about you being with God and trusting him. But the devil will always be revealed through the Holy Spirit. Because even though he says that he's fighting for prayer to be reinstituted in school, the bottom line is, Another issue is that he makes the statement that I did more for Christianity than Jesus did. What an idiot. You can't have Christianity without having Christ. Anytime somebody tells you, I'm a Davis, right? That they did more for the Davis household than my daddy did, that's a problem. What he's saying is, I created Christianity in 2020. And Christianity has been here for years and years. Are you with me? Over 2,000 years ago. Are you with me? I said over 2,020 years ago. More than 2,020 years ago. And then when the same man makes another statement that says, I can save you without a silly cross. That's a problem. And people just flock. People just follow. I couldn't even follow a preacher that made idiotic statements like that. That's a worldview. It's a terrible worldview. Are you with me? So Jesus saying to this church that, that you were partakers of grace with me in Jesus Christ. We were on one accord in Jesus Christ. You are partakers with me. We are yoked together through Jesus Christ. We are on one accord through Jesus Christ. You are partakers of the grace in him. Verse number eight. For God is my witness. Let me tell you. <laughs> if you're going to have a witness, there's no greater witness than God himself. He says, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. He said, I ain't lying to you now. It was, all, it was, it was amazing last night. I, I, I try not to watch Jim Campbell because he played Jimmy Kimball because he plays so many replays. You, you may turn him on tonight and he's still talking about 
our, our Thanksgiving's come. But last night I just knew he was going to be on target, so I watched him. And it was, it was pretty amazing when he, he broke down the State of the Union address and he had truth and lie. And that red thing would turn, the, the one on the lie would turn red every time a lie was told. And you know, I probably could be a story writer because I told Sister David how it was going to happen, right? He says, he, said, he makes a statement, uh, makes a statement, uh, this red button don't lie, just keep popping up. Uh, uh, I told her, by the time we get to the end, that thing going to go crazy. Go, and it did. It was red all over the place. And then all of a sudden, it exploded and his hair started standing up like that. It's because, <laughs> it's because of a lie. God says, Paul says that, that God is my witness. God is my witness. I greatly long for you. And I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, pastors can only pastor with pastors' hearts. You can't just get a preacher to pastor. You, you, can't, you can't just get an individual to preach. I mean, we can get up and we can say a lot of things, but when the rubber meets the road, how does the pastor's compassion come out when you're hurting? Everybody just can't pastor, you know. Everybody can. You got you to gotta have a pastor's heart. You have to have a shepherd's heart. You have to have the affection of Jesus Christ. You have to be impacted the way the people are impacted. When they're sad, you're sad. Regardless of how holy you are, when they hurt, you hurt. That's why before I, I accepted anything here at the New Beginning Church, I asked the brothers a question. Y'all do know it was all brothers. Are y'all looking for a pastor? They had some women on the, on the committee, but they weren't making any decisions. Are you all looking for a pastor or a preacher? Are you all looking for a pastor or a preacher? Why would I ask that question? Why, why would I even have the audacity to ask that question? Are you looking for a pastor or a preacher? Why would I even ask that question? Do they just want somebody to show up? They just want somebody to show up. Who would that be if they just want somebody to show up? He'd be a preacher, right? What's the difference? Pastor's a leader. What's another thing? He serves the people. What's another thing? He has a caring heart. Anything else? Knows the word of God. He knows the word of God. Say so he leads by example. Paul says, I have the affection of Jesus Christ toward you. You all have gotten in my heart. Matthew Davis says, y'all, y'all have just gotten in my heart. <laughs> I knew I'd get a big laugh on the second one. Pastor Davis said that. <laughs> <laughs> you all have gotten in my heart her point she said Pastor David said that her point is when y'all ain't in my heart I'm Matthew David <laughs> did I read it right <laughs> in other words you have to have a pastor's heart and so when you're not in my heart and you really have gotten on my nerve i got to go back to being the pastor and not Matthew Davis. Are you with me? Because a pastor has to have a heart, an affection, just like Jesus Christ. Has to have the mind of Christ. Have to be able to walk with the people and be a, be a blessing to the people. Paul says, y'all got in my heart. I'm saying, you've got in my heart. And because you're now in my heart, I have no choice. Even if I don't want to do right, I still got to do right and not do wrong. The reverse is that's true. 
Am I in your heart? Do I make a difference? I got one. Do I make a difference in your life? Well, this lady came to laugh tonight. <laughs> the, the question is, do you have compassion? The compassion of Jesus Christ, the affection of Jesus Christ for other brothers and sisters. At the end of the day, Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 1, this mind that was in Jesus Christ, it needs to be in you. You ought to be able to, to laugh when they laugh, cry when they cry, support when they need it, be a blessing to other people when you don't benefit from it. The question is, do you have the affection, the love of Jesus Christ in you? Question or comments? Anybody? Questions or comments? Nobody? No takers? All y'all got the heart of Jesus Christ, the mind of Christ? Everybody have affection for one to the other and just love what's going on and we support everything that's going on, right? Yes? I'm going to see today what kind of love and affection you have for your brothers and sisters as well as Jesus Christ. Okay, your homework assignment is to read uh, chapter 1. Read all of chapter 1 uh, in its entirety. Study it. Do your word study. Look up the words. Look up the Greek meanings, your cha chapter one of Philippians. What is your homework? Read it, study it, look up the word, do your word study for Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter one. We want the heart of Christ. Christ had a heart that was so great until he died for us. And he rose for us. And he still has the same heart. He is coming back for us. Philippians chapter 1. I have the test questions for Philippians chapter 1 next week. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We ask you to bless us with the mind of Christ. We pray for this church and all the listeners, Father God. We pray that you continue to bless us and move in, upon our lives and keep us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Let me thank those who joined us by live broadcast. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Sheremont Road, Houston, Texas. If you're ever in the Houston area, please come by and visit with us. We'll be glad to have you, and you will be glad that you have come. If you want to support this ministry, you can do so by tuning in to our cash app. Our cash tag is cash tag NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC S O U L S NBC Souls. Thank you so much. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.